Welcome to Term Talk, a Federal Judicial Center video podcast. Each term, we discuss the Supreme Court cases most important to federal judges. Joining me is Professor Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean, and Jesse H. Choper, D- Distinguished Professor of Law at University of California, Berkeley School of Law, and Laurie Levinson, Professor and Director of the Center for Ethical Advocacy at Loyola Law School. Thank you for joining us today to talk about how the court's opinion in Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee uh, and how it impacts the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Laurie, for the first time, the court applied Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to time, place, manner voting restrictions. Can you tell us about the act first and then how it was applied to these cases, please? Yes, Jim. Uh, The Voting Rights Act, which was passed in 1965, was aimed at eliminating the historic practices and procedures designed to bar Blacks from voting in elections. And there are two key provisions at play in that act. First, let me talk about Section 5. Section 5 was a preclearance provision that required federal pre-approval before certain voting restrictions came into play in states across the country, especially those states with a history of voter suppression. But in Shelby County versus Holder, which is a key case in 2013, the Supreme Court held that the formula used to determine whether Section 5 preclearance was going to be used was based upon outmoded data. So the court said you can't use that, but don't worry. You have section two to make sure that there is not discriminatory action. Then we look at section two. Section two prohibits voting practices or provisions that discriminate on the basis of color. In the city of Mobile versus Bolden back in 1980, the Supreme Court had interpreted that provision as requiring discriminatory intent. So Congress came back in 1982 with an amendment that made it clear that only discriminatory impact was required, that the law itself requires that the processes be, quote, equally open, provide an equal opportunity for people to participate, and use a totality of the circumstances approach. But here's what happens. The court in Brnovich has now severely weakened the ability to use that section two of the Voting Rights Act, which is the only remaining section to do so now when the court says you can't use section five. So in Shelby County, the justices 5-4 said uh, the preclearance formula was no longer grounded in current conditions, that's quoting them, because, and again, quote, the country has changed since its enactment in 1965. And as Laurie said, Section 5 would not be applied until Congress fixed the formula uh, and established a new factual basis for the the new formula. Uh, The majority in Brnovich breaks down the uh, 6-3 along similar ideological lines. So Erwin, can you talk to us about this case, please? Yes, this case involves two provisions of Arizona law. One said that a vote would be counted only if it was cast in the person's precinct. The other said that an absentee ballot could be turned in only by the person or relative who is meant to prevent ballot harvesting. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in an en banc decision found that each of these provisions had a racially discriminatory impact and violated Section 2. But the Supreme Court, in a 6-3 to three decision, reversed the Ninth Circuit an opinion by Justice Samuel Alito. So, Erwin, how did they arrive at the decision? As you mentioned earlier, Justice Alito said this is the first time that the Supreme Court has considered the application of Section 2 to restrictions on the time, place, and manner of voting. The other cases it all involved challenges to how districting be done and whether it diluted the votes of minority voters. Also, the court stressed, as you and Lori pointed out, the need to look at the totality of the circumstances. Justice Alito said, since this is the first time the courts considered this type of situation, it wanted to give guidance. And it said courts in applying section two should look at five considerations. First, the size of the burden on voting. Justice Alito said, all voting laws will have some burden. Unless there's a substantial burden on voting, it doesn't violate section two. And here the court found, there was not a substantial burden. Second, how far does the challenge law deviate from what was common practice in 1982? Why 1982? 
because as Laurie pointed out, that's the year that the Voting Rights Act was amended. And Justice Alito says, there were many far more restrictive laws in 1982 than the two from Arizona being considered here. Third, what's the scale of the racially disparate impact? Just Alito said, some disparate impact isn't sufficient. He said, there'll always be some disparate impact. The differences in education levels, employment will mean that there's some disparate impact. And here he found it to be fairly minor. Fourth, what are the other opportunities to vote in the state? The more there are other opportunities, the less any particular restriction is found to violate the Voting Rights Act. And just Alito said, there's many other opportunities to vote in Arizona. And fifth, what's the strength of the state's interest? And here he said, Arizona has a strong interest in preventing voter fraud. All of this together led him to the conclusion that Arizona's laws did not violate Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. The Ninth Circuit had also found there was a racially discriminatory intent, and that violates both equal protection and the Voting Rights Act. But, Justice Alito said, the Ninth Circuit erred. The district court had found no evidence of discriminatory intent, unless the Ninth Circuit determined there was clear error, and it didn't. It acted inappropriately in reversing the district court. Lori, what did the dissent say? Justice Kagan wrote a vehement dissent, joined by Justices Breyer and Sotomayor, and she starts out by outlining the history of racial suppression of voting in the United States and the real need for the Voting Rights Act. She notes that under Section 5, since 1965, almost 1,200 voting laws across the state were invalidated, and that without Section 5, Section 2 was more important than ever. But the way that the court now treated Section 2 wouldn't allow it to do its job, that the court was misusing the totality of the circumstances provision in the statute, and that the Voting Rights Act now, without Section 5 and without an effective Section 2, could not do its job. Quoting Justice Ginsburg from Shelby, she writes, it's, quote, like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Laurie, what are the most important takeaways from this case? Jim, I think the takeaway and the only way to see this is that it really is a major blow to the Voting Rights Act in protecting minority voters, that it's extremely difficult now to apply Section 2 and the protections it's supposed to provide for voting restrictions that, as you know, are popping up across the country, that you have to almost get that discriminatory intent showing that Congress amended the statute to say you didn't need, but it's hard to know what will be enough now on this court's approach to the totality of the circumstances. Erwin? I very much agree with Lori. There are going to be many lawsuits filed in federal court challenging the newly adopted state statutes restricting voting. This is the key case judges have to focus on, and it is one that's going to make it much more difficult for courts to determine this violation, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Thank you both for being with us here today. As always, it was a pleasure. 